Hey guys, what's going on? Hope you're doing well. Pandita, how are you? Oh, you have Susto? What's Susto? It's a culture-bound syndrome found primarily in Latin America, described by Razuk in 2011 as a condition of being frightened and chronic somatic suffering stemming from emotional trauma or from witnessing traumatic experiences lived by others. You're so dramatic. Well, that's what we're talking about today though, right? Are you well? What does it mean to be well? What does it mean to be sick? Um, it's a tricky question to answer right now for a lot of us and the anthropological perspective is particularly fitting for thinking about the different meanings that health and wellness have in context. Um, because as anthropologists, right, we think comparatively about health and wellness across time and across space, uh, relativistically, as we try to understand how the causes of illness and the treatments make sense as part of a larger cultural system. Uh, we think holistically about how health and wellness isn't just individual, but it's a trait of communities, right? Impacted as the World Health Organization set states by quote, where we live, the state of our environment, genetics, our income and education levels, and our relationships with friends and family. And Pandita, you know what? Do you know, do you want to know something? No, because you have susto? All right, well, guess what? So having access to healthcare is like a really huge thing in terms of determining the health of populations and communities. But factors like income and education and social relationships and the environment that might seem like unrelated to physical health when we take a biomedical sort of individualized approach, right, um, have been shown by the WHO to be the most important factors in determining one's health. So I think that's pretty interesting, right? Thinking contextually, um, it's not just sort of a, like a brain experiment. It tells us, it lets us see, see things that matter, right? So, what we're going to see as we think about the reading um, is that applying the key characteristics of the anthropological approach lets us see more than just a body or a cell or a disease. Thinking through the key characteristics of the anthropological perspective that I just you know, talked about gives us a larger understanding of how health is a group phenomena, right? It's not just a character of individuals, but it's impacted by social and structural forces and it's understood differently in different contexts. So wait, so Pandita, pause. Well, Pandita, wake up. Okay, whatever. Um, Pandita, I just went through the key characteristics of the anthropological approach, and you're just a dog, and so you don't know that what I say is important, but the key characteristics are super important, so you should write them down. And then... You can think about how they apply to what we're talking about. And then you can write some more things down and then you can have a treat because you are a good anthropology student. Or, okay. or you could just lie here. So in one sense, health and disease can be seen as biological, right? Uh, we've been talking about evolution and adaptation and how adaptations happen on both biological and cultural levels. Pandita, do you have your notes now? Look at your notes. What were some examples of biological adaptations? What about cultural adaptations? You haven't been studying. I'm over you. So, okay, but do you remember like um, a really long time ago, right? We were talking. Um, this was before I was talking to my dog and making jokes into my computer monitor. But we were in class, it was like a real class, and it had like, you know, 
doors and windows. And the windows didn't open. And the heat was always on. It was the good old days. No. Um, but we were talking about the potential for a pandemic, right? And we were also talking about the recent plastic bag ban. Um, so this is probably like the first week in March. And um, I was saying that while I think the way we use plastic bags is super problematic, um, I was also playing anthropology like I, you know, am ought to do. Um, and I brought up the issue in San Diego when banning plastic bags led to an outbreak of hepatitis, right, that required major public health spending because plastic bags were being used by the city's homeless population to hygienically dispose of their poop. And the point was that when we think holistically but also about the difference between real culture which is like what people do and ideal culture which is what people you know think we ought to do we can see the unintended consequences of uninformed actions and what we've seen now is that reusable bags have become disease vectors right um, in our current situation and we're no longer encouraged to bring our own bags to the grocery store because they spread illness. I mean, also, you can you can wash and disinfect your bags, y'all, because um, you're gross. You're not gross. Your bags are gross. So my point is these aren't, like, connections that I draw or I... What? Sorry. Or I drew um, because I can see the future. But because comparative thinking and anthropology lets us open our eyes to things that we wouldn't otherwise think about. And sometimes traits and adaptations, both biologically and culturally, um, that help to ensure the survival of our species can become maladaptive. Um, as cultural changes interact with human biology, the environment, and other you know, factors and traits. So we go back to this big idea of thinking systemically and recognizing that a variety of factors like biology, culture, the environment, technology, the population, etc. They're all related and a change in one impacts all of the other ones. So in the U.S., right, we tend to construct illness and disease um, as a negative thing. Right? We wage war against illness. We fight. And we beat a disease. That's not the only way to think about it. It's not the only way people do think about it. Um, and diseases are complicated. So we need to think adaptationally or evolutionarily um, and comparatively about change over time as well as relativistically to try and understand the way various factors impact the development of illness. Um, Pandita, can you wake up for a second? Hey, Pandita. She's awake. You just can't see her. Um, Pandita, I'm talking about disease and illness, and I'm not sure that you know the difference. Do you want to go back to the reading and look it up? Pandita, look. Look at the camera. Did you do the reading? Did you do it? You don't know what page it was? It was on the online textbook. It's not a page. Perspectives. Yes, Pandita, the link is on Blackboard. It's also on the syllabus. You can Google it too. Oh my God, I'll totally type for you. You're so lazy. So we've been talking about the agricultural and the Neolithic revolution. So, um, oh, 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 there we go. So we've been talking about agriculture and the Neolithic revolution. So let's start there. The biological ability to retain fat, right, would have been advantageous to hunter-gatherers and foragers who were nomadic, so they didn't store food or produce surplus, right? But with the change to agriculture, cultural change, right, subsistence strategy, and the consequent changes in the way we produce food and the types of food we eat, the ability to store fat easily has been a factor in the epidemic of obesity that we now see in the United States. And like thinking culturally from a biocultural perspective, um, we can also see things like how body size and the way that it's seen um, as either, you know, a sign of 
gluttony, um, a lack of self-restraint, or maybe a sign of health or wealth or privilege or beauty. These things vary cross-culturally. There's another cool example that we read about in the textbook, sickle cell anemia. Um, a lot of us might know somebody who has it or who work with people who have it. So sickle cell anemia is a recessive disease, right? Which means that you need to have, uh, you need to inherit the gene for sickle cell from both of your parents in order to develop the disease. Uh, when you have sickle cell anemia, what happens is your red blood cells, red blood cells are shaped like a sickle, like a half moon, right, like that. Um, and it makes it more difficult to carry oxygen through your body. Um, it's painful. Um, it's more likely to cause death. Makes it more difficult to reproduce. So. In light of all those factors, it would seem that the trait would have been selected out of the population as a result of natural selection. If we viewed natural selection as survival of the fittest instead of survival of the best fit for a given environment, right? Which is how I've told you um, we should think about it. Now, in the U.S., so sickle cell anemia is known as a disease that's most common among African Americans. That's kind of true. The interesting part is why, right? So cultural and environmental context are super important here. The gene for sickle cell is found most often amongst groups in Southeast Asia and Africa where malaria is widespread. Malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes um, and it's it can be super deadly. It became a problem only after the Neolithic Revolution um, when agriculture led to deforestation and also the collecting of standing water, which is where um, mosquitoes breed. So while carrying both copies of the gene leads to the disease, carrying only one copy of the gene, so being uh, what's known as a carrier, means that only some of your red blood cells have the sickle shape. So you might be anemic, but you won't get sickle cell anemia. And here's the key thing, you'll have an increased resistance to malaria. So it's complicated. The interactions between biology, environment, culture, and changing context and how we understand and make meaning of these super complicated scenarios. So also, we didn't have epidemics until we started settling and living in cities, which began with the Neolithic Revolution, right? Like we're seeing now with coronavirus, um, densely populated areas lead to a rapid spread of disease. Nomadic hunter-gatherers didn't come into contact uh, with the same frequency as we do today, and they could just, uh, you know, peace out um, or avoid people who were sick. Cultural explanations about the cause of disease are called ethnoetiologies. Etiology is the study of origins, and specifically it relates to the study of disease origins. Um, and ethno is like group, like ethnic. So in the U.S., we look at disease mainly from a biomedical perspective, meaning disease is a problem with the body that's... Just, I don't have a disease. You don't have a disease. I'm just pointing my, it's fine. You're fine. You're, it's your susto. Um, so anyway, in the U.S., we see disease as like a problem with the body. Um, and we address that medically. But that's not the only way of understanding health and illness. Cross-culturally, we can think about two main other kinds of approaches uh, to the etiology of illness. We have personalistic approaches and naturalistic approaches to how we understand disease and illness. And that's important when we think about how we can address things like health um, in a more effective way. So here's another big point. It's so big, Pandita's like waking up to listen. She's like, word y'all, she's on to something. Ethnoideologies or ideologies about health and disease they don't exist only like somewhere else amongst other people or like in the past, right? We all have culture. 
Candida is culture too. No, she doesn't actually. It's a uniquely human phenomena. Um, but that culture, it's shared in some respects, but also, you know, it's not all the same. Um, we have cultural traits and values that might be mainstream or dominant approaches, but that doesn't mean that um, culture or cultural ideologies are homogenous, right? Or that people don't resist or challenge these things. So, okay, like when you're sick, right? Do you pray? Or does somebody pray for you? Oh, this is not the part you want to talk about. Where are you going? This is like, just like when you guys walk out of class when I'm in the middle of speaking. It makes me feel so sad on the inside. Um, she's coming back now. I know you feel sorry. Like, it's fine. Just go. stop being annoying. Look, I made a spot for you so you can be in the video too. Do you get vaccines? Um, do you take prescriptions and pills? Or do you think that Big Pharma is conspiring with the government to make people sick for profit? Um, you know, look, that might be the case. Uh, it has been in the past. And there are definitely certain groups more likely to be targeted than others. But that just that doesn't mean that vaccines are bad, guys. And also, vaccines don't cause autism. And also... Don't inject disinfectant into your body to kill coronavirus. Um, that was some dumb stuff. But do you drink garlic tea when you're sick? Um, do you rub Vicks everywhere? Or do you use Dettol or Buckley's? Because, like, obviously Buckley's is the best. And why don't they have it here anymore for, like, under $30 a bottle? Um, or, you know, does a shot of potato vodka kill everything that could possibly be wrong with you? These are all examples of actions that we take based on underlying ideologies or systems of ideas that um, are interrelated with ethno-etiologies of disease and illness. This might be a thing to write about in your weekly response journal, like a place to make a connection with the text, perhaps. But first we're going to talk about personalistic ethno-etiologies. So in the late 30s and the early 40s, there were a lot of ethnographic studies done among the um, Hibinuba people in southern Sudan and the Azande of Central Africa that focused on beliefs regarding witchcraft um, and supernatural forces. And these studies can illustrate personalist, personalistic ethno-ideologies. Um, among these populations, disease and misfortune wasn't looked at in terms of how something arose in the body. But since disease and misfortune was seen as the result of aggression, right, or punishment that was directed by a particular person, personalistic, towards another particular person. So in order to treat the disease, right, you would visit a shaman who will figure out who or what is causing this illness and how that actor can be appeased or um, obstructed. Shaman or traditional healers and spiritual leaders, um, their abilities might be explained by being able to cross into the spiritual world, but we also see cross-culturally that shaman have a deep, deep knowledge of local ecology and how to use plants and other resources medicinally. Now, some of you get sick when the weather gets cold, right? Or if you're out in the rain, or if the weather changes a lot. So attributing the cause or the origin of disease to natural forces 
um, is a naturalistic ethnoetiology, which explains disease and illness as the result of natural forces, like cold or heat or winds, etc. So we can also use naturalistic etiologies to explain emotional um, difficulties in some uh, lines of thinking, right? So susto, like Pandita is suffering from right now, it's an illness recognized by the uh, Mike, M-I-X-E. Um, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. It's either Mike or Miche. Sorry. But um, it's an, they're, the Miche are an indigenous group who live in Oaxaca, Mexico. So this, like Susto isn't only recognized there, but I'm talking about Susto and studies done um, in that particular setting. Because remember, anthropology is specific to times and to places and to populations. So Susto includes like difficulty sleeping, a lack of energy, a loss of appetite, maybe nausea, vomiting, and a fever. It could be explained as anxiety or depression in another cultural context, but that would be an edic, E-T-I-C approach, or one that relies on the outsider or the scientist's perspective. An emic, E-M-I-C approach, stresses the way that the people experiencing that phenomena understand it. And in fact, susto doesn't fit neatly into any recognized biomedical category. It's seen as a form of suffering that's emotional, that's spiritual, and that's physical. Um, the result of a shock or a fright that is so great that it can cause the soul to leave, like to sever from the body. And so susto is usually treated with herbal remedies and a burrita or a, like a sweeping ceremony that's designed to repair the harm caused by the shock. But these are categories that anthropologists made up, and in practice, people attribute illness and suffering to a variety of things, and they make sense of them in a variety of ways. And when you think relativistically and really try to understand all of these ways, like they usually make sense. So here's an example from Evans Pritchard's famous study of witchcraft among the Azande. There is this boy, right, and like, and I'm. I'm going to paraphrase and tell his story in my own way. Um, so there's this boy. He breaks his toe because he tripped on a root that was growing on a path that he took every day to go, like, somewhere. I forget where. But it was somewhere that he went every day. And Evan Pritchard was like, yo, what happened to your toe? Kid was like, oh, witchcraft. And Evan Pritchard was like, mm, yeah, except there was that root and you tripped over it. So, and the kid was like, yes, it's a root. I tripped. <sighs> That's how I broke my toe. And so then like Evans Pritchard was like, word, so it wasn't witchcraft. And the kid was like, yo, listen, Linda, Linda, listen. I run on that path every day. That root is there every day. I know how this happened and like so do you but why every other day i've avoided the route and today i tripped that coincidence witchcraft i mean and so when we think about it like that right it's not so wild we all have explanations for things like why me that sort of fall into that um supernatural uh, explan uh, uh, explan uh, explanatory category. It was hard. But we also see here that like ideas about health um, are really often inseparable from religious beliefs and general cultural assumptions and ideologies about misfortune. Um, and I think we can see that today when we look at, you know, the pandemic. That also might be something to write about in your response journal. 
So Western biomedical approaches are just another type of ethno etiology that's rooted in a specific cultural paradigm. So assuming that medicine is the only like rational and factually based approach to treating health and illness um, is an example of ethnocentric thinking. Remember, ethnocentric is the opposite of culturally relativistic. So, I mean, it's fine. Like, that's fine if that's how you want to be, if you want to be an ethnocentrist. Um, but, like, as an anthropologist, you're trying to understand others and then reflect on your own cultural beliefs, not start from the assumption that you know what's really real and that everybody else is just silly or, like, not caught up to you yet. Right? That's problematic. Now, mental health is also a super interesting topic to think about cross-culturally. Um, so like Western psychiatry tends to see mental and emotional health from a more biomedical framework. Um, but anthropologists can look at these same illnesses not as solely biological in nature, but rather a response to interactions involving the environment social and cultural relationships and ideas, and our like chemi uh, chemistry and biology. So again, we're coming back to that holistic, systemic thinking. So instead of thinking about like universal categories of mental illness, what we see when we think anthropologically is that people express psychological distress through a variety of physical and emotional symptoms. And the patterns of these symptoms vary uh, cross-culturally um, as cultures frame mental health concerns differently. So Arthur Kleinman did a study regarding um, depression in China. It's discussed in the reading. And his study showed that patients who were depressed didn't describe sadness, right, like they do in the US, but instead, they complained of boredom, discomfort, uh, feelings of inner pressure, pain, dizziness, and fatigue. So the way we express distress, the categories that we create to sort of um, socially construct our experiences, right, in the public sphere, um, are cultural. Now, schizophrenia, another super interesting example. Um, the World Health Organization, right, the WHO, has concluded that among societies where communities are more accepting of the symptoms associated with schizophrenia, um, people, are less, people are more likely to be integrated into the community. And they're integrated more completely. So the illness tends to be less severe. And people have a better quality of life. So the stigma surrounding illness and the way that we treat that illness is transferred on to the people who are affected by that illness. And that process impacts both the subjective experience of illness or you know how someone um, experiencing schizophrenia experiences it, um, but also the outcomes for individuals, right, um, experiencing schizophrenia. So I think that's pretty interesting. Now here's something to think about, all right? I wonder if we can compare stigmas around mental illness to stigmas around COVID-19 which is the disease caused by the novel coronavirus. I mean, that might be something to write about in your journal entries this week. Hint, 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 I don't know. Um, so, the last thing we're gonna talk about is biomedical technologies, right? So, tools that help us address illness, disease, um, health and wellness. Things like drugs, vaccines, right? Um, they might allow us to eradicate certain forms of illness and suffering, but like, like literally everything else we're ever gonna talk about, um, 
because this is a big theme in anthropology, there are, are far-reaching consequences for other aspects of the cultural and social systems of which we're a part, right? And those impacts differ depending on who you are, where you are, and a whole bunch of other things. So, like antibiotics, penicillin, saves lives. Before penicillin was discovered in the 1940s, bacterial infections very often killed people. But with the introduction of antibiotics, people began to understand illness and disease in a new way, right? So new technologies impact the ideas that we have um, surrounding illness and disease. Now, coupled with capitalism, we also have the advent of the pharmaceutical industry and, you know, the biomedical sort of model of uh, understanding health, wellness, and illness. Now, in some parts of the world, antibiotics combine with, you know, technological advances like access to clean water and sanitation contributed to what's called an epidemiological transition um, and what that means is that, is that there's a sharp drop in death rates particularly among children that's good right um, you know so in many countries the result of this uh, epidemiological transition was a sharp and sudden increase in the human population and a shift in the kinds of diseases that were present. So in like wealthy countries, we have chronic conditions like cancer and heart disease um, as the leading causes of death instead of bacterial infections. And the average lifespan has increased. But that's not universal, right? In developing countries, while millions of lives might have been saved by antibiotics, High poverty rates and a lack of access to regular medical care means that children um, and, you know, like infants are surviving into childhood, but now they're in danger of malnutrition, of dehydration, um, and of other ailments. So we need to think about all aspects of the social and cultural system and these larger systems of which they're a part, right? That's thinking holistically. Now, it's like not all bad and negative, though. Medical anthropology, and I think that's why, like, that's what's really cool about it. It allows us to understand various factors that give rise to, like, any phenomena. And then, hopefully, create interventions that can address factors that often go unacknowledged or ignored. So, this was one of the points that Bourgois was making when we read his work early on in the semester. Remember, um, in your journals, journals for this week, you can think about how what we've talked about here connects to things that are going on in our world right now. Um, and there's also other cool stuff in the reading that I didn't get too into, like culture bound syndromes, for example. Um, but all the terms and the concepts that I used are defined in the glossary at the end of the chapter. That's what I have to say about that. Um, I don't know, right? Like, live long and be well, stay healthy. Um, I'm sorry my clothes are wrinkly. I'm doing the best I can. Have a good day, guys. You've got this. You're more than halfway through and I'm proud of you.